I want to welcome you to Answers for Today. What an exciting program that we had with for you guys today is I have my very good friend Steve Zober here today. And we're going to spend a couple, of day, a couple of weeks talking about his journey to truth, how he came to know Jesus as his Messiah. Uh, Steve, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's good to be here. Why don't you give everybody a little, just a short, brief introduction of who you are. And then we want to talk about the nation of Israel, the miracles that we saw in 1948. And I think from your perspective, you could shed a lot of light to, to a lot of people about that miracle. Steve, tell us a little bit about your history. Well, I was raised in a beautiful baby boomer era. I was born in 1950 in a, a home that was um, assimilated Jews, secular Jews. My parents had, didn't have any religion or, or anything. Hmm. But um, but it was a, a good time growing up, and and due to the fact of my grandma being a pioneer for the establishment of Israel and her vision for Israel, I started getting an interest in the nation of Israel. You know, so you're basically raised just like anybody else exactly. here in the United States. You were just happened to be a Jew, but something happened to you where you said your grandmother start being stirred about the nation of Israel. In fact, I thought we would spend the first part of this program talking about the, that marvelous stirring in the hearts of the Jews to return to Israel. We're to put up a little chart that Steve prepared for us that, that Lord, uh, where Steve, you mentioned a 50 year cycle. What does that mean, that 50 year cycle? Well, uh, it's not a dogmatic thing, but you see in the, in the history and one, that's one of the things I want to emphasize. God's stirring up the hearts of the Jews to come back to Jerusalem, to come back to Israel after 2,000 years. And we've never forgotten, even in the Passover, which we're having soon, that they talk about next year in Jerusalem. Yes. And so the 50-year cycle, in 1867, there's an archaeological dig where they found the ancient city of David. And then 1917, 50 years later, there's General Allenby, he took from the Ottomans, he took back mm. Jerusalem. And then 50 years later, 1967, the, the Israelis took back Jerusalem in the, and we're at the Western Wall, the, at the Wailing Wall, some people call. And then this year, an exciting thing, Donald Trump, <laughs> he, after everybody else kicking the can down, already, he said, for 3,000 years it's been the capital, Jerusalem has been the capital. So he had the guts to say, this is the land of Israel. This is the capital of the Jewish people. That's a very important point that you made with Donald Trump just made a, a, a couple, well, a few months ago, Steve. You being a, a born-again Jew and, and also probably really in touch with what's going on over in Israel, in Israel is there excitement with Donald Trump's statement? What is the response of the Israeli of Trump President Trump, I like to refer to, to make Jerusalem the capital. Oh, well, the Israelis are thrilled, and and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is so, so thankful that we have a president who acknowledges and supports Israel and is there for Israel in the midst of, you know, 800 million Arabs around the world that have in the history wanted to destroy Israel. So we got we got a, a president that loves Israel, and um, and believes in uh, the great future of the nation of Israel. It's amazing. Well, like you said, there's around the nation of Israel, there's something like 800 million, you know, those who are opposing this little, small, little nation from even existence. And I just applaud President Trump willing to step up for them. And I believe that his heart was inspired by God to be able to Absolutely. do this, you know, be able to say it. But it always, always wasn't like that. Israel, in fact, they, they've had very dark, times the Jews and all the way back maybe you could tell a little bit about your knowledge of what was happening in Eastern Europe and probably from your ancestors your grandma and all that tell give the people yes. here a little history what was going on yes in the in the 1800s there was a stirring of the hearts of even uh, Gentiles not Jews but uh, Pastor Darby in the middle 1800s 1830s and 40s he read in the Bible that the Jews are to come back hmm. to Israel. What, what was that in eighteen hundreds? You said eighteen thirties. Eighteen thirties. Pastor Darby. Okay. He was dispensationalist, and 
and he believed that Israel is going to become a nation again. And, and so there was a stirring of, of the hearts of the Jewish people as well. And that became uh, apparent when in the late 1800s, the Tsar of Russia and the Cossacks, they started to have what's called pogroms. They would go through the towns and, and villages where my grandma lived in Poland, on the border of Poland and Russia, and they would go into there and ransack the town and, and try to kick the Jews out. And my grandma would, would she shared with me that she would actually go climb in the trees and hide wow. while they came through. Wow. And, and she fortunately was able to get out because she had some nephews in um, Pittsburgh that she could babysit. <laughs> so they let her, they let her come to America. Uh, they, that was her, her lead into America. And she, and she had this stirring of her heart for Israel to become a nation. In that same time, uh, Theodore Herzl, he uh, started the first Zionist Congress, and that became a big emphasis to go to Israel. Our people should come back to Israel. And my, and my grandma would share stories about knocking on doors for money and for shovels and tents and medicine, and they said, don't hold your breath. There's never going to be another uh, time for Israel. Matter of fact, Uganda has offered a place, and, yeah. and that the Congress, the people got furious. No, we don't want Uganda. We want our country, our, our people to come back so to So they Israel. were given a, an option for the Jews to settle in Uganda, yeah. of all places. And yet, uh, to back up a little bit, you're saying well before Hitler was ever persecuting the Jews, you say the czars were going into Poland and... And we have a picture up there of a, this gal hiding in a tree. And, yes. and you, you saying that that's what was happening for, to your grandma, that she was facing heavy persecution of Jews, Jews back then. And so they had to flee. They did yes. flee. And so that was how uh, the Zobars, uh, Steve, how you ended up here in the United States. Right. Did she go through Ellis Island? She did. She went through Ellis Island. She didn't know a word of English. She knew Polish, and somehow somebody mercifully helped her to get her way to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And then you said the Zionist movement, 1897 by Herzl. He yeah. created it, and that was an inspiration where they were thinking, no, we have no other option but to return to the land. Steve, your knowledge of the land of Israel, when you go over there now, it's not what it was like back in 1890. I mean, right oh, now you go over there, it's beautiful, it's fertile land, it's like the fruit basket of Europe. Yes. But it wasn't like that back when they were wanting to go back there, was it? Oh, no, it was it was very rustic. And uh, I know my grandma had pictures of, of um, she would adopt, you know, sponsor orphans. And she would, uh, that had parents had died from malaria or terrorism in yes. the early years. There was malaria. It was it was really uh, uh, up bad. in north. Uh, uh, if I remember right, up north of uh, Sea of Galilee, the Hula Valley, and all that was more like a, a, marsh. a more marsh, and were infested with malaria and everything yes. else. Then you also make mention of a guy named Wiseman. What what was that all about in 1917, Steve? Uh, Chaim Weizmann was a scientist, and he was from England. Hmm. And he developed TNT, which helped England turn the tide to win World War One. Yes. And so, so they said, you know, they th were so thankful. Says, what do you want? We want to uh, t do something special for you. I don't want anything special for my Jewish people. I would like you to help us get our land back. He was focused wow. on that. And so the Balfour Declaration was written in 1917, but later, of course, England reneged on that. The Balfour Declaration was to, uh, to give the Israelis on paper their land back, but the air, the pressure from the oil was uh, too much, and so in the 30s, they reneged on that promise. Isn't it amazing how money talks and how much it does want to, you know, have people, you know, renege, like you said, on the, on the agreement they had, but the great news is that no matter what man was doing, God was in control. Absolutely. Steve, God had made a promise to the nation of Israel that he was going to return to the land. Could you share a little bit about the, 
the scriptures maybe that burn within your grandma's oh. heart and well, as you said that this pastor what was his name again da darby darby, darby. Uh, da what promises was there that returned to the land well and, and this is one thing i want to say my grandma didn't even know the scriptures, but God no. was using her. Oh. She didn't know the scriptures, yes. and I didn't know about it. At first, I didn't know even either the scriptures, but of course, and, and I'll talk later when I tell my story, but uh, in Ezekiel chapter uh, 36, verse 25, it mentions about the, 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 the ruined cities would be rebuilt, and the desolate land would turn green again. And, you know, of course, when you go over there, you see it's happened. But, but if you're back in the days, like you said, when Darby was around and when they first started thinking about going back in the land, it was, it was desolate. It was a, a, a country that's been worn, torn for many, many years. Jerusalem was nothing you wanted to look at, you yes. know. But yet God starts stirring in people like your grandma and other ones to have that great passion to return into the land. Okay, maybe you could share a little bit about, you know, some of the terrible things as we le lead up to 1948, your, the vision of your of your grandma. And, you know, we would be terrible if we didn't take a moment to to make mention of the uh, just the terrible thing that men do to other men there in World War II. The Holocaust was, uh, a lot of people like to even dismiss that it even happened. But it's a yeah. tragic unbelievable story of history yes you know it's just it's it's interesting you want to talk about it. just yesterday i was listening to prime minister netanyahu being talked interviewed and he said one of his heroes is winston churchill hmm. and he said if chamberlain who was before him yes wouldn't have wanted to appease hitler and everything's going to be okay everything's going to be all right if he would have had the guts that, Ch that churchill had to stand up against the opinion of everybody else. Maybe there wouldn't have been a Holocaust. Wow. Because he had the guts, he had the fiber, just like Donald Trump were talking about, as the fiber to stand up for the truth. And so as we saw, once again, I believe very much a satanic effort to wipe out a nation, the Jews that God had made his promise to, you know, even all the way back, we've seen it before in history, all the way back to the story of Esther, right? Right. Where, where the, you know, certainly the, the old wicked Haman and his plot was to wipe out the Jewish people, really to, to destroy the promises of God. Yes. And we're going to get to that here in a little bit, the promise of God that changed your life. But because God's word is true, it didn't happen, did it? And by the way, I heard a, a humorous uh, statement that, you know, you know, every generation, they they want to destroy the Jewish people under you know with Satan's influence, and uh, every time we get a holiday, like <laughs> Pharaoh tried to destroy us, we get Passover, and and, and Haman tried to destroy us, and we get Purim. And so yeah. he says maybe we have enough holidays; they don't have to try to destroy us anymore. <laughs> I like Purim <laughs> because you get those little cookies yeah. and all that. That's a, it's a fun holiday. 1948 is a, a year that it's really, I believe, that's marked in history as a, a, one of the amazing miracles of God. A nation that's been forgotten for 2,000 years. Yes. A people group and a language, everything. It's never been done in history, Steve. And Isaiah said about how can a nation be born in a day, but that's what happened, 1948. Let me read to you, and I'll put it up on the screen, Isaiah 66, and uh, uh, verses 8 through 10. He says, Who hath heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travails, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring t uh, to birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord, Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, says thy, the Lord thy God, Isaiah 66. Yes. The nation, after this tremendous period of time, you know, destroyed. Well, of course, we, we see it as the disbursement. Jesus predicted this, didn't he? In Matthew chapter 24, where, you know, the, the, you know as they were looking at this nation, how great it was, the disciples were oohing and on over the temple, and, and he predicted that, that they will be destroyed, 
the temple, the religious system that they had going, and they will be dispersed. But for a time, Daniel prophesied about that also. Yes. And so we saw how they were dispersed for 2,000 years, Steve. Yes, in, in uh, Isaiah 11, verse 12, it says, He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four corners of the world. <laughs> I was in, uh, we were on a vacation in Prince Edward Island, and we went over to um, Nova Scotia. And there, my, as one of our family members got car sick, and we ended up in this, this uh, uh, restaurant. And, and there was, well, in, in Nova Scotia, of all places, there was a, a grandpa and, and, the, and the parents that were running the restaurant and the grandkids, all Israelis, but they ended up in Nova Scotia <laughs> for the four corners of the world. They're, they're around the world. And... and it's almost like they got a, a, a wake-up call from God. And from 1948, there became this great exodus from around the world, or maybe not an exodus, but a, 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 a really call to return back to the land. And they started rebuilding. That's a, that's a, you people, you can go on YouTube, you could see this happening. They got great stories of them returning back into the, onto the land. and. Steve, it, it, that is a miracle, isn't it? Definitely, and, and that was uh, that was part of the thing that, as I entered into the land of Israel, that when I started noticing um, Jews that had come back from all over the world, and the, and the land that was desolate, green, that started to make me think about being a believer. So I didn't believe in God, didn't believe in the Bible. <laughs> I started seeing prophecy coming true. You know. So now we go into your story. You were born, where were you born? Los Angeles, California. You were raised here in Southern California. And you just, like we mentioned earlier, you just grew up uh, just a, a normal guy, right? And yeah, my dad's focus was to have three boys and have a lot of fun. And we went like to the Coliseum to see the Rams and go to national parks. That was all that it was about. Yeah, you know? and, and so you just enjoyed, you had your heroes and... Yes. Yeah, you loved it, you know, oh, like all kids. Oh, right? The 50s was a great time for Westerns. And, yeah. And I'm a big, was a big Western fan. And you know? Watching Zorro and Superman <laughs> and everybody like that. Dragon yeah. Train, Bonanza. Yeah. That's what I was into. But then our life started changing, certainly in the 60s. Uh, I think the big wake-up call for a lot of us, all of a sudden we start questioning things, was the assassination of President Kennedy. Yes. Did that shake you as a young man? Yes, uh, I got focused on him. You know, we all want to have heroes, and, yeah. and so at first it was the the Western shows. But then Kennedy became my hero, and I had I created albums and I collected every kind of picture of uh, newspaper, magazine, whatever of Kennedy. But then in junior high, you, you get the you know the announcement he was murdered, and and also found out things about his womanizing and. You know, even as a non-believer, you know, you're married, you should stick with your wife. And so the, the bubble burst about yeah, Kennedy. Yeah, your dream, dreams were shattered, weren't they, yeah. of, of a hero? Yeah, I don't have a hero. Yeah. No heroes now. And then uh, with that, we also were introduced in front of TV. Of course, uh, those who, who are a little bit younger didn't realize uh, we didn't have the, the, you know, Twitter. We didn't have Facebook and everything right in front of your face in a moment's notice. We were now opened up, and I mean, we were able to see each day, each evening on the six o'clock news, the Vietnam War right in front of us. Yeah. And that was horrifying to be able to see. I had personally had friends that were, that I knew that were in Vietnam that went over there, and did come back at the same. I think we just celebrated how many years? Forty years of the Viet since the Vietnam War, and it's almost become the un the forgotten war. But I know it impacted our lives. It impacted our nation. How, how did that impact you, Steve? Well, one way it impacted me is I went to the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> for a couple of uh, quarters, I guess. was, And they, they had just burnt the Bank of America because it's all about oil and we don't want to be in the war. And we weren't even able to go out into the, into the streets. We had, there were televisions monitoring. It was so chaotic. It was so confusing. And and uh, so there was a time of turmoil. It was a very confusing yes. time. And uh, many campuses, college campuses yes. across the country. Yes, it was very confusing. And and 
I didn't know what to believe. For, for me, I, there was a lottery system they started where my birthday was a good birthday. I didn't have to go to the war. I, I was <laughs> actually in the last lottery. Yeah. And I think I was number 73. And if they would have taken one more round of troops, I would have been in Ooh. the first round wow. to go, but they canceled it. So yeah, I, I just, <laughs> just made it, you know, but yes. Yeah, so, and, and there was all the similar earthquake. I was on like seven floors of the dorms, and now it was my life shaking, but I, literally we were shaking. Oh, and yeah, dorms, yeah. Everything was shaking at that point. You know? yeah. But you were trying to do, or maybe you adopt a, an attitude during that time, just like so many people, it seems like it's coming back around again where, you know, we're living in during a time, whatever makes you happy, you're going to do it, right? Yes. And that becomes almost your philosophy of life, right? Well, it, my dad's philosophy actually was do whatever you want as long as you're happy. He never explained himself. He probably meant professionally. <laughs> yeah. Like, you want, he was a pharmacist. So you want to be a pharmacist, that makes sense. You want to be a janitor, that makes sense. Just whatever you want. But I grabbed that, that phrase, he said, do it. And I explored anything that I hoped would make me happy. And you, <laughs> you, and you had no. Really, as you said, growing up, you weren't really coming from a religious family. No. So you didn't have any checks within your life. No, there to wasn't. Be able to show I you. tried everything under the sun. You know, but like everybody, every once in a while, there come storms in life. There comes different hiccups, per yeah. se. How were you dealing with those in, as a young man? You know, when you see tragedies, when you see problems, what were what was your answer? What were you trying to do? What, what was your resolve to those? Um, resolve to keep searching. I mean, I don't know. Resolve. I, you're talking about storms. I was actually in a in a snowstorm. Oh, physical storms. <laughs> I was in. A, uh, there was a class I wasn't even part of. It, but it was a class, uh, an English class, where they were going to go hiking into the mountains, come back and write a short story. I said, "Can I join you?" They said, "Sure." So I joined them. We got caught in a snowstorm overnight. These two fingers got frost, and I ended up in the hospital with IV to save my fingers, wow. and I, that shook me up. Everything was shaking me up. And You're so having I, your own personal earthquakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so on my way back to the to the um, campus to the dormitory, I'm thinking about life, and I went into all places. I'm Jewish. I went into a Catholic church, and I talked to the priest, and I told him what's going on. I'm not sure what to do with my life. He said, "You're Jewish. You should go to Israel." Oh, so my, my grandma's talking about Israel, and the priest is talking about it. He doesn't tell him about Jesus. He says, you ought to go to Israel. So that kind of prompted me. That to, started to go, get you going on your quest to yes. Israel. And so that was the beginning of your search. I'd like to read another scripture, Steve, and have you comment a little bit about okay. it. It's out of the book of Jeremiah, and I'll put it up there for everybody to read. And he says, and ye shall seek me and find me. When you so search, search for me with all your heart. So you had this time that you were searching. You tried tried different things, obviously. Why don't you talk about that search a little bit? Well, I, I hitchhiked all over the country. In those days, hitchhiking was pretty normal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you could st stand on if you wanted to go any place. Why do you need to buy a car? You just put your thumb right. on, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I so, remember those and days. Of course, my mom, being a loving mom, said, "Don't hitchhike." Yeah. Uh, there's an article she showed me that somebody was decapitated. Yeah. She said, "Thank you, mom. I'm going hitchhiking." <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one of the places as I was hitchhiking across country in Arizona. They recommend I go to this Indian reservation, mm. have a soup pie with these beautiful waterfalls. So I, I got a ride down there, went down this steep um, switchback, down to the Indian reservation. I ended up living there for a period of time with them and became friends with them. They gave me the honor of planting corn with them, where you chew a couple kernels of corn, spit it in the direction of those yellow speckles on the side of the Grand Canyon wall, just south of the Grand Canyon, and then the blessing will occur. Oh, There'll okay. be a blessing. For, for, <laughs> and then they say, you see this pinnacle right here? And, and I'm hearing from the American Indians, not from a Jewish person, oh, yeah. not from a rabbi. He so when the pinnacle that's like kind of looking kind of precarious, when that falls over, the Messiah will come. I'm hearing from the American Indians. So I, I, that's my first ever dis discussion or thought about Messiah from American Indian. From American Indian. <laughs> down and down yeah. in the Grand Canyon yeah. area, starting to say, you know, and so isn't it amazing that God had a, a call upon your life as Absolutely. he has on everybody? Do you believe that that call is out there even this day to everybody that we're, that's watching this, Steve? That's one of the things I wanted to encourage because you see God kind of, 
massaging the thing and nudging me and showing me these divine appointments. I didn't even know the term divine appointments. Yes. Everybody out there, everybody who's seeking today that there is a God, and if you seek with all your heart, like you're, you, you, you'll find him. And that's one of the things I want to mention is that I was I wanting really to know. I wanted to know. He knew I was jumping all over the place, but he knew in depth. I wanted to know, and he kept nudging me in the direction to find him. I'm sure that there's people watching us right now, Steve, that are sitting on the border. They've tried a lot of different things. What should they do right now to know God as their personal Lord and Savior? They want to say, you know what, I want that excitement that Steve and Terry has. They, I want to know where I'm going. What should they do? Well, the thing that you, we should all come to grips with is that that we all have a sin nature, and and heaven is a perfect place. And I, you know, we witnessed my wife and I go to the restaurant with Sheriff the waitress, and just the other day we shared and led somebody to the Lord, and he says, and my wife says, under what merit should you be able to enter heaven? Because there is a heaven and there is a hell, and it's a real thing. And she says, well, I'm basically a good person, and that's a red flag because. It says in the scriptures that our righteousness is filthy rags. And so we need to humble ourselves. And there is a creator. If you look at the, the universe, you look at all of creation, it's, it shouts out that there's a design, there's a designer. And there is the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so if you're really seeking with all your heart, he will open it up and there will be a bridge. Jesus is the bridge. There's like a valley and there's... Here's where we're walking. Like I was walking and wandering, and and if I don't come to grips with, with and and Jesus, the great Redeemer, has a gift of eternal life for you, then we're going to have to pay the consequences. We're rebellious, but allow Jesus to come in your. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one coming to the Father but by Him. I tried at, at University of California, Santa Barbara. I tried religious studies. I even tried um, chanting to a scroll. Uh, uh, and 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 the matter of fact, when I came to the Lord, they said, "If you destroy the scroll, you're going to be condemned." I, as soon as I came to the Lord, I put it in the fire and burnt it. But there's so many uh, things uh, that people can misdirect, but Jesus will never fail you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and He is the one that if you're wandering and you're wandering like I was wandering, He has a gift for you, and He will redirect your life. You know, it really salvation comes this easy. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, thou shalt be saved. Next week, as we gather again, Steve and I are going to continue on his journey discovering the truth. I hope that you tune in. You tell your friends about this amazing story of a man from Southern California, how he comes and discovers his this Messiah. May God richly bless you. ...about this broadcast, or if you have any questions, feel free to mail us at Agape Chapel O.C., P.O. Box 4023, Huntington Beach, California, 92647. Or you can email us at aft at agapechapeloc.org. Or visit our website at agapechapeloc.org. Until next time.